Welcome to a presentation on Angels Don't Play This Harp, based on the book by the same name, published by Earth Pulse Press. What we're here to talk about is a ground-based Star Wars weapon system that's being operated in the state of Alaska in a remote location uh, called Gakona. The project um, is an interesting project. We'll cover the various aspects that the military has disclosed, the University of Alaska has disclosed, and we'll also talk about a number of the applications that they've kept hidden from the public view. But first, a little bit of background on me. My name is uh, Nick Begich. I have a doctorate in complementary medicines from the Open International University for Complementary Medicines in Sri Lanka. And I also have a political background, having been involved in the Alaska Federation of Teachers in Alaska, serving as president for two terms, and the Anchorage Council of Education, also serving as president for two terms. My family has been politically involved in the state for a couple of generations. My father served in the state senate. He also served in the United States Congress in the 92nd Congress in the early 70s. The project itself was an interesting one, and one that we really weren't looking for. I think the project was more or less looking for us. Um, the project is a jointly managed project by the Air Force and Navy, being worked in conjunction with the Geophysical Institute, which is part of the University of Alaska system. This project uh, was initially started, um, actually, the, the, the work leading up to it in the middle 80s, and eventually in the early 90s, the project was kicked off with an initial funding level um, by the federal government of approximately $30 million. The project covers a number of military applications um, that's being characterized by the military. However, it's strictly a research project, which is interesting in and of itself. The way they characterize the project as a research project, HARP, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project, they've, they've made um, indication that what we're really talking about is a project to study the aurora. But the project goes far beyond um, study of the aurora in terms of, of its applications. In fact, it's more or less a misnomer to suggest that this is strictly about auroral research. It could be um, like characterizing, uh, in, in many respects, the um, Manhattan Project, which brought us the atom bomb, as being strictly a research project, not ever leading, of course, to a weapon system, which we all know is not the case at all. What HARP is, is a very large transmitting system. It's a system designed um, to generate a great deal of radio frequency energy. The way that energy um, is is, is created, first of all, just by uh, electrical energy going into um, an apparatus that's been designed uh, by the military that goes into an antenna array. And we can look at a few slides of that array just to give a general idea of what um, specifically we're talking about. The array itself is, is an antenna field, which is a large um, configuration. It's not just a simple radio transmitter as such. It's more than that. It's a field of antennas that work in, in conjunction with one another. Um, and just to kind of flip through the slides just a bit so you get an idea of, of what these look like. The array itself is pretty large. It covers, um, at this point, um, a number of acres. And as it expands, as the site expands, it'll expand to um, covering many, many, many times um, more acres in, ter in, ter in terms of this field. The antennas themselves are fired sequentially in um, in order to get a focusing capacity, which we'll discuss as we go go on with the presentation today. But basically what we're talking about is something much different than just a standard radio transmitter. In fact, um, many aspects of the project, uh, the project itself has been characterized as an open science project, and yet when you look at uh, some of the um, early, early stages of the project, you see some things that sort of don't run um, uh, consistent with that particular thought. When you look back at the original postings on the property itself that the military posted, and the prime spokesman for the project being uh, John Hecksher, he lays out um, a large uh, amount of the information in a way that, that people can understand, but at the same time in a, in a complex way in which uh, many, many word games are played. When we first launched the book itself and started talking about the project openly, the first thing that happened was the signs came down. These are the standard signage that's up on military installations, um, warning people that if in fact that you violate the perimeters that you're in violation of the National Security Act. Uh, 
being an open project as militaries characterized it, and when we started challenging that characterization, um, they quickly removed these signs. They then uh, initiated an open house, invited everyone in uh, to look at the project to see that there was nothing so sinister there. But it's kind of interesting. It would be like um, the average person looking at a uh, intercontinental ballistic missile carrying a nuclear warhead. What are you going to see from the outside shell? So they basically took the shell down, took the uh, perimeter signs down, and, and gave a little higher visibility uh, to the project in terms of the public. This project was interesting in the way it began. It began with um, the ideas of a particular inventor, Bernard Eastland. And Bernard was um, uh, hired by Arco Power Technologies. Actually, the company that hired him originally was Atlantic Ridgefield, which is the parent of Arco Power Technologies. And around his ideas, they built the subsidiary. And the subsidiary's role was to find a place, a way, to burn uh, natural gas on the north slope of Alaska um, and bring that gas into a marketable form. Currently, Alaska produces approximately a million and a half barrels of oil a day from the north slope of Alaska. We do not have a gas line constructed yet. And the primary owners of the gas that's on the slope, which involve trillions of cubic feet of natural gas, um, is Arco, Atlantic Richfield, and another company, British Petroleum. So Arco was looking for this way, some way to consume this power, and they hired Bernard, and they said, Bernard, we want a way to develop a market for this uh, gas, even without a pipeline. Is there something we might be able to do? And the, the, the conclusions for Bernard were, really, there might be. There was um, a vision in his mind of a weapon system that might be um, applied to this particular um, use, and, and it required a large amount of energy, but not only did it require a large amount of energy, it also required a very specific location, and that location is the closest um, that they could get where large supplies of natural gas would be available to the um, place where magnetic lines of force intersect the Earth, which just so happens uh, to fit the bill for the North Slope of Alaska. So Bernard began working on a series of patents, and the first um, patent dealt with the idea of focusing energy in a very unique way, different from any other radio frequency uh, transmitter previously designed. And when you when we look at what what he envisioned, when you think about radio frequency energy um, coming off of an antenna, normally what you can visualize can be shown as energy going up and the energy getting less and less dense as it as it moves higher and higher in elevation. And this depicts more or less the way traditional radio frequency transmitters work. The area they're trying to affect is the ionosphere, which is located approximately uh, 32 to 620 miles above the Earth. So it's a high area, it's a high level. Um, what Bernard did is develop an antenna field concept, which used instead of one antenna, it used an array, which is what we have at HARP. And by firing that array in a unique way, um, by sequencing the firing, they're able to focus the energy to a very narrow point in the ionosphere. What's important here is when you talk about radio frequency energy and when you talk about the way energy is focused, the old technologies, the technologies that the military often references when talking about ionospheric heaters, which is what they, they term these huge transmitters, they talk about the energy, um, in some instances, the energy going into the antenna array, which is interesting. They also sometimes talk about the energy coming off of the antenna array at the ground but never do they really talk about the amount of energy concentrated or focused in the ionosphere. Now, the ionosphere itself is an area um, situated very, very high um, above the Earth, as, as I've said, but it's also a very important area for our immediate um, environment. This particular layer can be visualized as a bubble surrounding the planet. Um, this bubble of, of energized particles keep um, uh, particle streams that would be dangerous to uh, human health from entering our immediate environment, such as X-rays, cosmic rays, and uh, various uh, radiations coming from the sun. So it acts as more or less a shield, a natural shield, to protect the planet. Without it, life would be impossible here. And this is the area that the military intends to, as they say, perturb, as we say, disturb, um, deliberately for weapons effects. Now, what's important and what's very different about this technology is the military will cite the idea that these ionosphere heaters are located in many, many places around the planet. However, what is what is located around the planet do not have the power levels um, that this particular transmitter um, has. 
what happens in, in the energy tr transfer, starting with the um, uh, ideal, ideally it would be natural gas, currently it's um, diesel power generators on site, generate electricity, that electricity then runs through the apparatus on the ground, the ionospheric heater, and through a principle called antenna gain, you get an effective radiated power and the upward uh, level with this system of one billion watts of effective radiated power. Now that's the power coming off the ground. If we go back to this image of focusing energy again for just one moment. So what we're talking about in terms of energy, it's not the energy going into the systems or into the antenna arrays. And it's not the energy coming directly off the antenna arrays at, at the ground level. What we're concerned about is the amount of energy at the point in which we're trying to create effects, which is the ionosphere. And as you can see from this um, characterization, the old technology spread that energy out. It was very, very um, low-density energy, whereas the new technology, the technologies developed by Bernard Eason, focus that energy into a very narrow beam. This is, this is the rating that is most appropriate, most important in describing this particular technology. In terms of talking about um, where this energy goes, what happens with this um, energy in terms of the, the overall project. When, when the military first unveiled this project back in uh, 1991, what they were talking about was the fact that, hey, this was unique because we had this unique focusing and steering capability, different from any ionospheric heater in the world, that would give us incredibly greater power potentials. More than that, they also compared to other systems operating around the world. There are five of these um, transmitters in the former Soviet Union. There's also uh, a system called Izikat in the uh, in Europe, and there's a very large transmitter um, in Nor Norway. The transmitter in Norway has a billion watts of effective radiated power of the ground, but using the old configuration, spreading energy out. The new technology is again the very big breakthrough for Bernard Eastland, uh, and also for Arco Power Technologies. Now, what's also unique when you think about energy being transferred to the ionosphere to create the varying effects, if, if we look at that image and we, and we talk again about the uh, idea of a, a bubble around the planet, this is another image of Bernardi's and showing uh, very clearly um, what can happen if you can energize this area. What he shows in, in energizing this is, is this uh, cyclotron resonance effect that creates this bubble. The amount of energy required to create a global effect is quite large. In fact, when Bernard Eason first envisioned this system, the amount of energy um, that he, he visualized coming off of an antenna field was somewhere on the order of 100 million watts. And we're going to come back to that number as we go through the presentation today because it's a very important um, issue in terms of what um, this project um, could entail. One of the things that um, when we go through the discussion of the applications of the technology, we'll, we'll talk a little bit, too, about the power levels necessary to create these varying effects. In terms of the overall um, program itself by the military, the military has maintained throughout this project that it has nothing to do with Bernard Eastman, which is, is in and of itself um, probably the uh, biggest departure from the truth. When you look at the fact pattern, the paper trail on the project, which we're going to present in a few moments, you'll see how Bernard Easton's work really does come into play on this project. What Bernard envisioned um, was a single antenna field of very large size. In fact, the, the um, size that he envisioned initially ran 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers square, huge by anyone's standards. HARP is, of course, much, much smaller than that at this stage of its element. But as we go into the next slide to look at the overall effects, a couple things that we can first take a quick look at. And if you look at the owner of this um, patent, um, this is APTI Incorporated, which is Arco Power Technologies, Inc., which is the subsidiary of Arco Atlantic Richfield. In this particular patent, not by Bernard, but one built upon Bernard Eason's ideas at the lower portion of the screen, in this section under U.S. Patents References Cited, this is where, um, where you're required to show um, the information as to where it came from or what built your idea. And when you look at the other portion of the screen, you know, what was this particular idea um, building? Well, it was a particle, it was based in part on a particle beam weapon system, on backscattering technologies, which is radar technology we'll talk about shortly, and also space-based ballistic missile defense systems or Star Wars systems. 
when you look at the uh, next slide, which shows sort of the application of what this specific um, specific weapon um, application is, I think we can see uh, quite clearly what we're talking about. In this case, we have graphically depicted at the bottom of the screen an antenna. Um, an antenna. In this case, is a single antenna, but um, it's strictly for graphic purposes. What it does is it sends energy up, creates an energy field around um, these objects in space, and then using a gamma ray detector, which is actually um, one of the one of the inventions that are held by APTI in a packet of inventions, can determine which of those um, objects are actually carrying um, nuclear payloads and which are not. Now, why is that important? When you think about um, attack, which the military envisioned for a couple of decades, what they envision happening is 100,000 incoming objects. And of those 100,000 incoming objects, perhaps 100, maybe 200, maybe as many as 1,000 would actually carry nuclear payloads. In order to isolate the target, you have to be able to discriminate which are decoys and which actually are genuine threats, because there's no way that we have the capability of, with certainty, taking out all of those um, targets. So the situation is in terms of the military has been, how do you distinguish? What can we do? In this particular uh, technological application, what you have is a system that can discriminate. In other words, reducing the targets to those that are really um, targets of interest. And this is done with um, a transmitter such as FARC being able to generate power levels of sufficient quantity and size. Now, it's not the only patent. As I said, there are 12 patents associated with this project. Three were Bernard Eastland. The others were based in large part on, on his work. But all of those other patents that were based on his work required one unique feature. They required a focusing capability. This was the key element in Bernard's work. In fact, the key element leading to his patent. The slide that we had showed earlier showing that um, showing that energy focus is, is really important in terms of um, application. And looking at this next um, slide, what we also see here is the idea of creation, creating um, an ionized um, uh, cloud above the Earth. Now, what this is used for is reflecting um, radio frequency energy for over-the-horizon radar applications. And you can see here also it is an APTI, Arco Power Technologies Patents, and you can see in the references cited again, this work is based in part on Bernard Eason's um, previous patents, again showing a connection and a trail. In terms of the next slide, it shows sort of the application of this and what it looks like graphically. And this is important in terms of describing the technology. When you look at this particular aspect of the project and what it does, in this, in this view, you can see what they're using here again graphically is they're creating a, a, a plasma layer in the ionosphere. And this can be um, visualized as a layer of energy. energy. Um, and what it is used for is reflecting energy from another transmitter over the horizon. And you can see the horizon of the Earth. And to look over the horizon to see what might be incoming. And in this case, it's showing picking up an airplane over the horizon. Now, as, as this diagram indicates it requires two um, transmitters. In fact, there are two in Alaska. There is a smaller transmitter called High Pass, which is located just outside of Fairbanks, about 250 miles uh, from the ARC facility. What's also unique is for this application, which can be called Over the Horizon Radar, the location of the current HARP facility is um, the old backscatter over the horizon radar site. So the military declared obsolete at the end of the Cold War, and they quit construction on that facility. But in fact, the record shows is that the technology wasn't obsolete because of the ending of the Cold War. It became obsolete because of the advancement of the technology. The old backscatter technology, when objects came close in from a distance, you couldn't distinguish what those objects were. It wasn't so versatile as to be able to be used close in at a distance. What this kind of technology, the new technology, um, brought in, in in the program allows you to distinguish objects at a very, very far distance over the horizon as well as within just a few kilometers of the site itself. And to be able to distinguish not only objects that are traditionally high up, but it will distinguish objects anywhere from the ionospheric levels, as I said, many miles above the Earth, 
all the way down to the Earth's surface. And this includes cruise missiles, making cruise missiles technology obsolete in terms of delivery technology for nuclear weapons. So in that specific application, what we have is a far superior and advanced uh, technology. In addition to that capability, the same transmitter also distinguish which of those objects, as we said previously, are actually carry nuclear payloads. And this, again, is, is, is quite important. In addition, there's a third application of this particular um, use of, of the HARP system. If you increase the power level even higher, you can create what are called bit errors in the computers, the onboard avionic computers controlling flight of those incoming objects, so as to cause the computers to fail and the objects to crash. At an even higher level of energy, you can create another effect where actually electronic components melt, causing uh, the missiles to disable and crash. Those are just some of the applications based on the patents. All of those patent applications tie right back to Bernard Eason. If we go to the next slide, in terms of additional uh, projects, this one's interesting. This is the idea of uh, creating an artificial ionosphere mirror, which can be tilted. Now, this is similar to what we were just talking about in terms of over-the-horizon effect, except what we have in this case is something that can be tilted, a plasma layer that can be tilted like a hand mirror, to reflect radio frequency energy as opposed to um, light energy, which, which is what a hand mirror would, would um, reflect. So that they can manipulate it. And what's interesting is the HARP documents itself actually show this particular um, use in terms of one of the primary uses for this technology, in addition to a number of others that we'll discuss as the presentation goes on. When you look at um, sort of the multi faceted aspects of the ionospheric mirror, we can look at the next um, view graph, which shows the plasma mirror here being generated from the antenna array on the ground for use in communications, um, sending communication signals over the horizon and maintaining communications for the use of over the horizon applications. In other words, a multiple number of uses using this ionospheric mirror. One of the other important factors when you consider energy being sent up to the ionosphere in terms of energy densities. You know, we talked about energy densities. You can walk out into a um, warm, sunny day where you're feeling heat energy. And that heat energy you feel is just comfortable, perhaps, um, warmth on your skin. But if you take that energy and focus it through, say, a three-inch uh, magnifying glass onto the skin, the sensation won't be comfort at all. In fact, in a few moments, it'll be burning your skin. It's the same idea here. What you have in this technology is this focusing concentration capacity that really brings about um, a technology previously only, only dreamed of in military planning circles. If we go to the next uh, slide and look at other application of technology in terms of what it's capable of doing, it becomes uh, even more clear. What this application is, is is probably one of the more interesting ones. When you look at um, a HARP transmitter, and this is, again, graphically depicted um, out of the patent files themselves, you'll see, in this case, um, a HARP-type transmitter irradiating energy, radio frequency energy, out into space to a reflector. In this case, in the patent, it describes a mylar reflector, which then bounces the energy back to the Earth to another point on the planet. So what you have, essentially, is energy entering um, the system in the form of natural gas being burned, converted to electrical energy, transmitted in the form of radio frequency energy, and then as radio frequency energy bounced back to the Earth, reconfigured into electrical energy, and then put back into an energy grid, making electrical energy available on other parts of the planet where otherwise it may not be available. A couple of problems. If you look at this reflector and you think about what would happen if it tilted slightly one way or another, recognizing the large distance between the points, a very slight alteration on this end would move this beam maybe through your neighborhood, maybe not. The question is, is the risk factors of this kind of application are fairly high. More than that, from a military application, military perspective, this is useful in terms of getting energy into a battlefield environment or en energy into an area where it might be needed. But commercially, um, the possibilities of this application are pretty pretty great. In fact, what they say in the patent is by the year 2000, this will be economically feasible to experiment with. The problem, uh, from our perspective, on this particular um, application is that it represents, again, a, a use of energy that 
that may in fact cross a number of lines. In fact, when you look at our uh, the subtitle of our book is Advances in Tesla Technology, this is probably um, the place where most people are, um, uh, think back on Nikola Tesla. And Nikola Tesla, for those that may not be aware, was the inventor of the AC um, generating and transmission system that we all currently enjoy for our basic power um, supplies in our homes and our businesses. What Tesla envisioned also was a way of transmitting electrical energy wirelessly. In fact, when you look at the early um, patents Bernard Eastland, it's Nikola Tesla's ideas that stimulated um, that particular um, interest on, on Bernard's part, and Bernard saw the applications. In fact, um, when I first looked at the Harp story, the way I ended up getting involved in the Harp story was reading an obscure journal article in an Australian publication uh, called Nexus talking about Harp, and it mentioned the first three patents of Bernard Eastland. What I did then is go to the library, pull those patents, review those patents, and they referenced a couple of New York Times articles, one from 1915 and one from 1940. What struck me as I read those was, you know, who was doing this kind of work in, in, the, in 1915, 1940? And the first thing that jumped to mind was, it's got to be Tesla. And when, in fact, I pulled those original patents, it talked about a new weapon system with huge potentials, potentials that would, in fact, even melt um, electric circuits on airplanes many, many miles away. And this is early, um, just after the turn of the century and then moving into um, the beginnings of World War II in 1940. So that was sort of the creative impetus. But one of the other areas of his interest was, again, this power beaming idea. Um, when we look at this particular patent, what's interesting um, is APTI, Arco Power Technologies, actually got to try this. They got to experiment with this in Canada and actually get an um, object um, in at a very high elevation um, to utilizing no onboard uh, fuel supply to utilize radio frequency energy in this way. What's also interesting is a project operating on the University of Alaska Fairbanks called SABER um, is taking advantage of the same technology, the idea of focused um, power beaming. In fact, the person responsible for that was referenced in the power beaming technologies um, patents mentioned um, earlier by us, and also the key people involved in that technology in the 60s are still involved in it today. The only difference is it's now operating out of University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the only other difference is the stumbling block of the 60s was it had no way to focus the energy in the unique way that HARP can now focus that energy. In terms of the key people on this project, John Heckscher is the military's program manager. He is also a geophysicist based out of Haskam Air Force Base, um, the Air Force being sort of the lead on the project. Uh, Bernard Eastland, um, in, a, in a secondary role in many respects in, t in terms of where he sits today. I mean, basically, once he came out with his patents, the military took those patents through um, Arco Power Technologies and then sort of shuffled Bernard off to the side. Uh, the other inventors, however, stayed in the game. And what was interesting is about how the key personnel sort of develop in this story and in this project. In the RFP, the request for proposal put out by the military originally for this project, that's the document that governs sort of the bidding and contracting process. The only thing that was considered proprietary or secret in that document was the name of, names of the key personnel assigned by Arco Power Technologies. And this is interesting because it's those key personnel that become important um, in linking some of these technologies together. Um, what was interesting about the way those were segregated or kept out of the picture, normally if something is classified, the military takes a black line and just rolls it right through on the lettering so you can't read through it. In this case, they used a uh, yellow sticky note, which when you burn it on a Xerox machine and then you hold it up to the light, it bleeds through and you can read the names which is exactly what we did. And in that case, um, we were able to tie in the key personnel assigned to the project to some of the specific patents that reference Eastland's work, which brings us right back to Bernard Eastland again. More than that, when we tie it into the original military documents on the project from 1990 um, and 1991, all of those applications and those other patents clearly um, jump out, and they're, and they're absolutely the same thing. When you look at the key personnel in terms of um, sort of where it goes from here, 
um, it, it pretty well tells the story. I mean, it's, it, it is a university run project on the front end, but they really don't have much to do with it as much as providing a few technicians. It's really a military program. It's also designed on a couple of other bases. I, it was designed in the specification to run remote, so it can be operated from any place in the world that has communication systems uh, sophisticated enough to interface with its computers. And more than that, it's also designed modularly. So they can continue to add to the antenna array, making it larger and larger um, in each um, each edition without throwing away any of the old, old components. So it's uh, a modular, versatile um, tool as well. When you think about the corporations and sort of how the technologies tie together, let's talk a little bit about this bidding process that led to Arco Power Technologies getting this award. Arco Power Technologies, according to uh, Dun and Bradstreet, is a $5 million a year company as of 1994. Pretty small by anyone's standards. And as a subsidiary, it had virtually no background in um, military uh, contracting experience. Now, when they bid on this project, they bid against a company called Raytheon Corporation. Raytheon is one of the largest military contractors in the world with $10.2 billion a year in 1994 in annual sales compared to the 5 million annual sales of Arco Power Technologies. The initial contract on this project, however, was for $30 million. When you think about a $5 million company winning a $30 million contract when they're bidding against a much, much larger company, that certainly raises some questions. But not only did they win the first phase, they also won the second phase of the contract for $175 million, although that phase is currently not funded by the United States Congress. Again, it draws lots of questions for how such a small company could win such a large contract with no military experience. Raytheon, on the other hand, was the developer of the Patriot weapon system, missile system that was used in the Middle East in our conflict there with Iraq. So it's a system in a, in a company that's capable of doing much, much more than an oil and gas company in Alaska. So how can a company that small gain this kind of a contract? There's only one way, and that's with proprietary information, knowledge so specialized or so um, carefully controlled by the company, no one else has access to it. In that case, it's the package of 12 patents surrounding the HARP project. What then happened becomes even more interesting in terms of corporate structure on the technology. The company, Arco Power Technologies Incorporated, was sold out to a company called E-Systems. E-Systems bought it out in uh, June of 1994. E-Systems is one of the most secret companies in the United States in terms of um, their primary contract experience. They are a $2.1 billion a year firm. Um, of that $2.1 billion a year, $1.8 billion of that is for a national security organization, such as the CIA, military intelligence, and other intelligence organizations. Of that $1.8 billion, $800 million are black projects. Those are projects so secret the United States Congress is unaware of what they're funding. In terms of this type of company and what they're doing with this, with this project, what did they get when they bought out Arco Power Technologies? They got the second phase of the construction because the first phase was already completed, um, and they got a uh, package of 12 patents. What's interesting about E-Systems is they were featured on a 60-minute segment the last week of February 1995, which really just amplifies what I've just said in terms of what kind of company they are and what kind of work they do. They were also featured in a, a 1990. For an October 1994 article in the Washington Post. It was a front page article, again, describing exactly what I've described. A very secret, super secret company specializing in surveillance technologies, primarily for intelligence organizations in the United States. What becomes even more interesting is the next corporate merger or buyout. And this buyout involved, again, Raytheon Corporation. And if you remember, that's a company that lost the original bid on this project. Well, Raytheon bought out E-Systems and all of the rights to this particular technology along with the second phase of the project. So now Raytheon, one of the largest military contractors in the world, is in control of a cluster of technologies that become quite, um, quite unique and quite interesting. As I said in the very beginning of this presentation today, what we're really talking about is a ground-based Star Wars weapon system. Why would Raytheon have an interest in such a system? 
That's a system that would provide for them at its full development perhaps billions and billions of dollars in government weapons money. When you think about HARP as a versatile weapon system, not just for its surveillance capabilities, but let's talk about a few of the other capabilities that this system has. One of the primary movers in the project early on was the idea that this system could be used for also geophysical probing. Now, what exactly is geophysical probing? It's the idea of looking into the Earth to see what structures might be under its surface several miles deep. What the military calls this particular application is Earth-penetrating tomography, the idea of looking into the Earth. What's, what's interesting about this particular application is in 1994, when the HARP program planners went to the United States Senate to ask for additional money for their second phase of the project, the Senate said no. Not until earth penetrating tomography became a higher priority on the project, which is exactly what military planners began to work towards. In fact, in 1996, this year, it is the only application, the only testing funded by the United States Congress. They were able to get $15 million for this funding, which um, actually will allow them to begin um, testing this year. Now, what is, what are they looking for in this particular application? What's interesting in this application is the, the Senate, when the uh, heart planners went in and sort of sold the project to the defense uh, subcommittee of the Senate, they emphasized this application being useful for nonproliferation and counterproliferation, the idea of finding third world countries, nuclear um, facilities, testing facilities, um, and storage facilities, which, as John Hexer said to us in an interview, would be useful had we had this technology during the Gulf War. For the Senate, it's a priority. For the United States Congress, it's a priority. And certainly, many Americans would feel the same way. That this is an important area that we need to um, have a handle on in terms of what's going on in nuclear arms development around the world. What's unfortunate about the particular application is some of the side effects that we're going to talk about as we go through this, uh, this presentation today regarding the physiological effects of those types of systems on human beings. But we'll get to that in a while. One of the other applications of this technology, and one that the military spoke about early on. In fact, it's the only one that they spoke about early on in what they called their fact sheets. The fact sheets on this project were pretty interesting. They were put together predominantly for the local community of Kona, which is very small, and we're talking a few hundred people that live there. But obviously, they were all very concerned about what the military might be bringing to their part of the woods. Um, in terms of that technology, when what they said that this was all about was, first of all, the military said it's strictly a research project with maybe a little bit of a spin-off in terms of communications technology. And what they were speaking about and what they spoke about in those fact sheets early on were the idea of uh, a, a system for creating what's called an extremely low frequency, an ELF, for communicating with submarines. Now, the way this used to be done in Wisconsin, Michigan um, area of the United States, they have very large antennas buried under the ground. These antennas run 14 to 28 miles long apiece. And they create a very long wave, a signal, that then penetrates the earth, penetrates the ocean, and signals submarines. What this technology does is much, much different. In fact, it takes it to much higher state of, um, of technology and capability. What it does is it takes this technology, it takes the signal um, from this ionosphere heater, from this HARP transmitter, it causes the ionosphere way above the Earth to begin to oscillate, to pulse, at a frequency that creates back to the Earth an ELF, an extremely low frequency. This frequency then goes to the Earth, to the ocean, and communicates with submarines. So in effect, what they do is they change the ionosphere from just a natural shield to part of, a mechanical part of a weapon system. It's that same application that's used for Earth-penetrating tomography the idea of looking into the earth to see what's under the ground. Now, one of the other applications of earth penetrating tomography beyond just locating underground nuclear facilities, which will be for distinguishing between mineral strata, such as oil and gas fields, um, ore bodies of various kinds, because that strata has a, has a different signature or characteristic. What the military has said is, even though that energy is coming back to the earth, it's not something we need to worry about because the, the amount of energy involved is approximately the same as the amount of energy which naturally occurs in the Earth in any case. The problem with that is 
it doesn't line up with the research. And we're going to talk about the frequency ranges of earth penetrating tomography as well as the physiological effects of that application um, as we go on through the presentation today. One of the other um, issues that is raised by military is the idea, um, in fact it was raised first by Bernard Eastman in his patent, um, of creating electromagnetic pulses in the upper atmosphere. Now what is an electromagnetic pulse, an EMP as such? It's a pulse of energy that causes electronic circuits to basically not work, to go haywire, for computers to fail. The way these used to be created was with a thermal nuclear detonation in the upper atmosphere, which would create an energy pulse covering a very large area below, knocking out electronics. With a HARP transmitter, you can artificially create um, the same electromagnetic pulse over the same large area, but without radioactive radiation as a byproduct. So it becomes a much more advanced um, technology. One of the other um, possibilities with this technology, and one the military acknowledges, is the idea of blowing holes in the ionosphere. The idea of opening up a space in this natural shield that then lets all of those incoming uh, energy streams in our immediate environment. While it might have some interesting weapons effects possibilities, it also has the possibility of having uh, profound effects on uh, human beings. This can be compared, um, blowing holes in the ionosphere, to creating holes in the ozone layer, except with much, much um, different uh, consequences. When you're talking about blowing holes in the ionos ionosphere, you're really talking about something that um, uh, would make ozone layer depletion pale. You know, ozone protects us from ultraviolet um, radiation, which can cause some, some forms of skin cancer and can cause some forms of um, severe sunburn, and it's an area that, you know, certainly everybody's been uh, concerned with around the planet. But when you're talking about the, uh, when you're talking about the ozone layer and you're talking about um, the ionosphere, you're talking about something much, much different. The kinds of radiations that enter the system uh, th through um, a hole in the uh, uh, ionosphere are much, much more damaging. In fact, so damaging that they could um, alter the genetic blueprint on the planet if left open and exposed for any great length of time. The military says not to worry. John Hexer says not worry. The holes will fill back in um, relatively quickly within within minutes. But you know something that uh, the research shows and we cite in our book uh, is that that the the holes in the ozone, for instance, when they um, have disclosed to everyone how horrible it is to use aerosol cans and so forth. What they fail to mention in the scientific research shows, and it was first discovered with the launch of Skylab, Skylab created a huge hole in the ozone layer. In fact, every time we launch a rocket or a missile or a space shuttle through that layer, we create a hole or a depletion in ozone. Yeah, and they used to say then, don't worry, within a few hours, everything sort of comes back together. It's still depleted, it just comes back together and the overall density of the ozone layer is de de depleted. It takes millions and millions of cans of aerosol to amount to one space shuttle launch, yet you don't hear them talking about curtailing those. Um, what you're talking about with uh, the, the ionosphere is, of course, much much more important, and the question becomes to trust them um, with that basic uh, premise that it'll fill back in um, shortly after they turn the device off. The issue of um, this kind of technology in terms of military trust is also an issue that we explore um, within the text of, of the book. And, and something I want to say, you know, at this point, for many of you who have not seen the book, it is well footnoted. There's 350 sources cited within the text, and those sources are easily obtained. So the things we're speaking about here today aren't just coming from us. It's really the military's words, the government's words, what we're doing is, is characterizing it in a way that makes it readily and easily understood. When you talk about some of the, uh, the other applications, potential applications, and you talk about these kinds of ionospheric instruments, some people have asked and it's come to mind that uh, the woodpecker signal, which originated out of the former Soviet Union in the early 70s, this signal was picked up first by ham operators um, that were picking up a buzzing, clicking, sound, hence the name woodpecker. Um, it's interesting to note those same transmitters that the uh, military talks about in terms of HARP technology when comparing HARP to others around the world happens to be those same transmitters associated with the woodpecker signal. 
What's interesting about that is the woodpecker signal in the early 70s had a number of um, things attributed to it that were quite interesting. One of those um, items was the idea that it was creating uh, anomalous or unusual phenomena in the atmosphere. Uh, some asserted that it actually created weather modification, weather changes, and some even asserted that it had profound physiological effects and mental effects on people um, in Eugene, Oregon. What happened out of that was a number of people raised objections. Um, the signal was curtailed sometime in the uh, latter 70s. And what's also interesting about that is when they curtailed the signal, it was around the same time that the United States signed off on weather modification agreements. Weather modification is one of the areas that harp transmitters could be utilized in a, in a very effective um, way from uh, that perspective. And this is an area when we first spoke about it and, and first introduced people to this whole idea of weather modification using manipulated um, signals from a radio transmitter. The first thing, people's eyes glaze over and they look at us strangely. But the fact of the matter was, in 1977, in December of 1977, the United States, with over 60 other countries, signed an agreement, an international agreement, forbidding the use of weather modification as a weapon of war. In other words, over 20 years ago, the technology had advanced sufficiently to cause international concerns, the kinds of concerns that led to agreements to curtail its development and use at a time when we hadn't even signed off many of our um, nuclear arms agreements and many of our chemical weapons agreements. And yet, the state of that technology became of such great concern that the international community decided uh, to cut off the use of that uh, technology. What's interesting is in that agreement there are exemptions. The exemptions are for domestic use or use that doesn't migrate across national boundaries. Why that's interesting is in the course of in the course of heart technology, the whole idea of weather modification was breached by a number of folks out um, in the rural parts of Alaska, who, when they looked at this technology, were raising those kinds of questions. Could this be used for weather modification? Now, where they raised that objection and where they raised that question was with the Spectrum Planning Committee, which is a subdivision of the United States Department of Commerce. In presenting um, their, their objections in formal uh, form, the way the, that Spectrum Planning Committee responded was, was a little bit unusual. What you would have expected, had it not been used in that particular way, for them to just say, no, HARP will not be used for weapons um, applications of weather modification. But instead, what they said is, no, it won't affect weather in any significant amount, and therefore it's exempt from this international treaty. When you look at weather modification technologies and development of those technologies, it actually goes back even as far back as the 1950s, in the early 1970s, it was the focus of a great deal of research at China Lakes in California. Um, a number of programs were instituted to develop systems for weather modification. In fact, more recently, in a program called SpaceCast 2020, which is a um, sort of a view of where future weapon systems will go, it was put together by the uh, military. SpaceCast 2020 involved 350 scientists. It re ended up in a 1,600-page report, of which only about 20 pages were released to the public. But within the context of those pages are discussions of the new weapon systems, including weather modification as a weapon of war, but very cautiously stated, in fact, um, because they realized that these international agreements prevent that particular use. One of the other applications, and an application that comes um, extremely important to discuss for the purpose of this presentation, deals with the physiological effects of this science. The effect of this science on human beings is really the, the most important aspect of the technology. And we need to go back a little bit in history um, to talk about what sort of things have been discovered or uncovered regarding this kind, this kind of science, the use of radio frequency, energy, and its effects on, on human beings. We can go back first to um, a document that we uncovered in our research, a book called Unless Peace Comes, with a um, chapter in it by a gentleman by the name of Gordon J.F. MacDonald. Mr. MacDonald was actually a uh, professor. He was a professor of uh, geophysics at uh, UCLA, and he was also a science advisor to Lyndon Johnson um, when Lyndon Johnson was president. What his specialty was, MacDonald's specialty was, the uh, idea of geophysical warfare, the idea of creating triggering events um, using man-made means for 
um, creating huge um, effects uh, in our immediate environment. The chapter that he wrote for this book um, was actually called How to Wreck Your Environment. And what he was focusing in on, the things he was zeroing in on in his research were what would be called nonlinear effects. Effects that don't really make sense on their surface when you think about a small amount of energy going into a system and a large event amount of energy coming back. In fact, a scientist, uh, Al Zielinski, a German scientist, gave us sort of a couple of models to use for describing nonlinear events. And so I'll use those to sort of describe what that entails and sort of explain how this all connects together. If you look back, um, and Al Zielinski says, think about it in these terms. He goes, put a row of dominoes lined up from, from where we are sitting in Seattle, uh, USA, all the way to Paris, and hit the first domino with a 10-gram weight. And then think about all of the energy released as those dominoes fall all the way to Paris. Now picture it a little differently and think about each one of those dominoes increasing in size by, say, a half a percent. So by the time that the last domino um, is at Paris, it's about the size of the Eiffel Tower and it's crushing it. And still you initiate the first fall with the 10 gram weight. What exactly is going on there? It's nonlinear. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up point to point to point in terms of how we think about energy being released. How could a 10 gram weight cause that kind of an action? Well, it's not the 10 gram weight. It's the interaction between the dominoes and gravity and the triggering event is the 10 gram weight. The energy release is gravity. The same can be visualized with harp um, type radio frequency transmitters. In fact, John Hector, the program manager for HARP, indicates that this type of uh, nonlinear effect um, is, is possible. In fact, in the documents themselves, they lay out nonlinear effects. One of those nonlinear effects of an effect discovered by a professor in and out of Stanford University was discovered in Antarctica. The nonlinear effect that he saw was much, much different um, than the previous example we just gave. What he saw and what he observed in Antarctica was that VLF, very low frequency radio waves, when they strike a coupling point between the ionosphere and magnetosphere, which is an area about 620 miles above the Earth's surface, what occurs, the energy goes up, it strikes this point, and there's a huge energy release where the amount of energy delivered amplifies up to a thousand times creating a virtual particle rain over the area below, an energy particle rain. This was discovered using VLF transmitters of very small size. Now, remember back in the very beginning of our presentation today, we talked about a billion watts of energy being focused into a narrow beam, striking the ionosphere. Now picture that energy coming up to the ionosphere, striking the ionosphere, and amplifying a thousand times. Now we're talking about a nonlinear effect, bleeding energy off of the magnetosphere in a way that then creates a huge effect, um, potentially even globally. This is a nonlinear effect. Perhaps it makes a small transmitter like HARP, large by any other standards, but small compared to Eastland's idea of a transmitter. Perhaps it gives the ability to deliver the kind of energy Eastland envisioned by tapping into that natural energy above our ionospheric shield. Why this is important, again, is it's another area that was missed in all of the disclosures on this project in the course of the development of the technology, and yet the scientist who's um, uh, named as one of the discoverers of this phenomenon is actually attached to the project. So it's not a miss by accident, it's a miss by, by design from our perspective. But talking again about physiological effects, we have talked a, a little bit earlier about this earth-penetrating tomography application, the idea of looking into the earth. Well, when we interviewed John Hexer, my co-author Gene Manning asked him a question about well, what frequency ranges, what exactly is going on with this earth penetrating tomography. And what John Hexer described was a frequency range running from 1 to 20 hertz, or pulses per second, cycles per second. This just so happens to correlate with predominant brain waves in human beings. The 1 to 20 hertz range, predominant human brain waves run about 1 to 35 hertz for the major uh, brain activity. What has been discovered in science is that externally um, driving uh, brainwave frequencies is possible. In fact, this research goes back, and we cite it within our book, to a gentleman, Jose uh, Delgado, who was a, um, uh, studied electrophysiology at the University of Madrid uh, in Spain. 
Um, he got his degree in electrophysiology in the early 50s and then came to the United States in the 1960s to work at Yale University as a specialist in brain um, research. Well, at Yale, what his main area of interest was, was looking at sort of the effects of electromagnetic uh, fields, um, electromagnetic energy on brain function. And what he used initially in the 60s were brain implants, electrodes implanted into the brain of, of primates and in the brains of humans, triggered by electrical impulses, creating various changes in behavior. In fact, the behavioral changes were like turning on the emotions of animals, like switching a light switch on and off. Pretty profound. But what it required were implants. What later happened and what he later showed is that this could be done wirelessly. In fact, the way he dramatized um, this was he put electrodes still implanted, but using radio frequency energy, he had a charging bull in a bull ring coming at him. Within a few feet of, of reaching him, he threw the switch and the bull stopped dead in its tracks. It was an interesting dramatization, but again, it still required implants. What Jose Delgado discovered in the 1980s was that he could create the same effect wirelessly without any implants using pulsed radio frequency energy. This is unique, this is quite different, and this is exactly what heart produces, pulsed radio frequency energy in some of its applications. The application being tested in 1996, earth penetrating tomography, is just such an application that will utilize this pulsed radio frequency energy. But this is Jose Delgado's work in the 80s. Now let's roll back a little bit, back to 1969 again. And in that chapter in the book, Unless Peace Comes, uh, Gordon J.F. MacDonald um, also mentioned an unusual phenomena. He suggested, based on research compiled at the time, 1969, that if you could ever figure out a way to electronically stroke the ionosphere, with radio frequency in just the right way, at just the right frequency, that you could create a situation where behaviors in human beings could be changed over very large geographic area. Now remember, he was a science advisor to Lyndon Johnson and a professor of geophysics at UCLA. He just wasn't some off-the-wall scientist. He was well-respected um, nationally and internationally at the time. And he was quoting the work of Ross Addy, who later discovered a number of effects dealing with um, radio frequency energy and energy's effects on physiology. What's also interesting is in 1970, there was another document put together. This document was a book, actually. It was called Between Two Ages. And on page 54 through 56 of that book, and the book was written by Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was a professor at Columbia University at the time. Later in the in 1976, he became national security advisor to Jimmy Carter, so certainly someone in a position to understand um, technologies, weapons effects, um, etc. But as, as uh, in, at Columbia University, as he put together this book, um, Between Two Ages, it was really sort of the, from his view, a, a point of separation between a non-technical world and a highly technical world. And the book was about the impacts of technology on, a, on the modern era. In fact, even though it was written 25 years ago, you can look at that book, you can read it today, and rather than being a forecast for the future, you could read it as a history, because pretty much what, I, what he laid out in terms of socioeconomic changes and technological changes was quite accurate. Zbigniew also predicted that if this technology were available, that most likely it would be used, no matter who was in power. That the temptation to utilize technologies to further political ends by whoever was in power at the time would be much greater than the good sense to restrain. Now you have to keep in mind, this is the big New Brzezinski's um, idea of how this technology might be presented, but it wasn't at the time possible, 1970 time frame, because they couldn't focus the energy in such a way as to stroke the ionosphere. Now, how would this work exactly, and what exactly does that uh, mean? In terms of um, what has been discovered and, and has been disclosed in, in recent years is that um, you can drive or you can entrain human brain waves with an external driver, with an external stimulation. Now, things that are pretty well understood and well talked about in, in most um, circles now is uh, light, sound, um, technologies and also um, electrocranial stimulation, the idea of using pulsed um, electric current on the cranium itself, on the head itself, to create um, changes in brain states. What, uh, what has 
been shown in the science is that you can also create the same changes in brain states using an external driver of radio frequency if it's pulsed in just the right way and shaped in just the right way. In, in the course of that, some things need to be understood. Important here is that um, Jose Delgado, who we mentioned earlier, a uh, professor at Yale University, what he discovered with pulsed radio frequency is that the amount of energy wasn't as important as the frequency in which that energy was sent to the human being. In fact, what he found was that the amount of energy necessary to create behavioral effects was only one-fiftieth of the amount of energy naturally created uh, in the Earth. In other words, what HARP will produce in the Earth penetrating tomography application is 50 times more power than is necessary to influence behavior. What's also important here to note is the frequency ranges themselves. Um, the basic brain frequency range is delta being one, approximately one to four hertz or pulses or cycles per second. Um, theta, which can be visualized as um, uh, not a deep sleep, but a sort of a dream state um, of sleep running between four and seven hertz or pulses per second. Alpha, which is seven to approximately 13 hertz or pulses per second. This is creative thinking. Um, state of uh, consciousness. Above that is beta, which is what we're operating now as I'm delivering this information to you and you're receiving it. And so what the frequency range of this particular application is within this frequency range of from deep sleep um, to this kind of um, discussion stage. So what happens when they um, initiate um, this particular application is potentially as a side effect being 50 times more powerful than necessary it may change the behaviors of people over a very large area, the same area that it's affecting for penetrating tomography, which is interesting also in that this particular application could cover an entire hemisphere, even at HARP's current um, energy levels. This is all important information because it turns out that the same um, energy effects, low frequency particularly, under 100 hertz or under 100 pulses per second, tend to be the frequencies that are the most biologically active. In fact, we can go to an Air Force document that we uncovered from the early 1980s that really talks about um, sort of the way this, this knowledge is shaping. And that document, if we could go to it for a moment, is the final report on biotechnology research requirements for the aeronautical systems of the year 2000. This is prepared by the Southwest Research Institute for the United States Air Force Office of Scientific Research, which is part of the Air Force Aerospace Medical Division. And it was prepared in J July of 1982. Why is this document important? This document sort of sets the stage or lays out the perimeters of what the research should look like. And within that was a section on radio frequency weapons. What was interesting about that section is it talked about the development of pulsed radio frequency weapon systems for manipulating human behavior to the point of debilitating troops over a large area. Now, what they envisioned was a little bit different than HARP. They envisioned something much, much smaller, but using the same basic principles of pulsed radio frequency. In a later document that came out that was put together by Captain Paul Tyler, this document is interesting. It was put together, this overall book was put together in June 1986, and it was put together um, to talk about low-intensity conflict in modern technology. It had a forward by Newt Gingrich. It was put together by the Air Force, Maxwell Air Force Base. This document had two chapters that were interesting, one by Captain Tyler, who's now a colonel, I understand, and the other was um, a, a chapter written on electromagnetic pulses. What these two chapters dealt with and how it ties to the HARP project is extremely important. Um, first of all, let's talk about the chapter dealing with the electromagnetic pulse. And we described that earlier as being an energy pulse that then comes down over a large area causing electronic circuitry um, to malfunction and computers to fail. In, the, in terms of this particular document, it talked about a battlefield sort of um, unit, something that can be mounted on a track vehicle. Um, or a tank or something of that nature for knocking out electron circuitry over a broad area. And one of the advantages they saw is it was essentially invisible. No one knew it would, would be coming, and the guarding against it would virtually um, be impossible for most um, military um, technologies around the planet. 
The situation with HARP is you have the same idea, but on a very, very large scale, a scale much bigger than anything else um, ever envisioned, because what you have with HARP is a potential of creating an electromagnetic pulse over the same kind of area as um, a thermonuclear detonation in the upper atmosphere. This is very important in terms of the long term when you look at what this technology may lead to. Although HARP is small at its current stage, in fact, the military says it's not a weapon system, which the same could be said about the Manhattan Project when it got its first $6,000 in appropriations. It eventually produced an atom bomb, but certainly at the early stages, legitimately you could say it's not a weapon system. That's the same word game that the HARP planners are playing with the HARP program today. It is at an early stage, and it will lead to a full-blown weapon system. What you can call this stage is the proof of concept, proving up the ideas around the technology. The next stage, which is slated for 1997 or 98, will take it the next level, which will be proof of concept um, in terms of prototypical design, a small version of the big system. The eventual system will go even higher. In fact, in our research, on this totally open, unclassified project, we found one document that was extremely compelling. It was Technical Memorandum 195. This document was so important to the military on a non-classified project, the way they handled it was quite, quite unique. First of all, it's 613 pages, and it's considered a memorandum, pretty long for any memorandum I've ever read. But in the front end of that document, they say a couple of things. First of all, it's not a public document. It's not releasable to the public. And that it represents only private communications between the parties. And that it's non-published. Yet, it's 613 pages long. John Hector was in attendance when it was compiled and is the program manager and denies knowing anything about this memorandum. So why would it be that John Heckscher would deny knowing anything about uh, Technical Memorandum 195? Well, when you look at the memorandum and what it was used for, it was used to build the contract document, the RFP, Request for Proposal for the Construction of the Initial Harp Facility. What was important about that document is it was a compilation, it was a compiling of somewhere around 80 uh, scientists' work um, as they went to a conference that was sponsored by the United States government. They were, they were um, transportation and uh, expenses of going was paid for by the United States government. It was printed by the United States government, yet it's considered non-published. Internal communications. Internal communications as such, um, private co communication between the parties would be exempt from Freedom of Information Act requests so that when you went to request it, they would not only say it didn't exist, it was non-public, they just flat would not acknowledge any existence of it at all, which is exactly what John Hexer does. What was in that that was so scary for them to reveal to the public or so um, secret or quiet that they wouldn't want it known? Well, a couple of things that jump out. First of all, the power levels. It first talks about what's required in the project and the power level initially of uh, one gigawatt, one billion watts effective radiated power. The second phase um, with power levels required of up to 10 gigawatts, 10 billion watts of power. And the third phase, which was a desired power level desired by these planners, was 100 billion watts. That's the power level that Bernard Eastland envisioned being needed for all of the effects that he describes in his patents. And that's the power level that the military acknowledges is necessary for things such as weather modification and global communications effects. Part of that global communication effect that's spoken about um, in the Eastland patents deal with the idea of being able to knock out everyone's communication, whether land, sea, or air-based, radio communications, television, military communications, knocking them all out, and yet the same signal used to sweep those various frequencies and disable them would be used to carry the communications of the military. In other words, their system would be protected while everyone else's was dead. In terms of going back to the physiological aspects and one of the other applications, you know, the whole idea of, of mind control, the ability to manipulate human behavior, this is another area where people get extremely agitated, concerned, and they say, well, you know, that's a little far out. Well, the research shows, um, Tyler's work shows quite, quite clearly that these effects are possible, not only possible, but he demonstrates with a number of examples how this might be used for debil 
debilitating troops in a combat situation. The concern that we have is as a side effect for some of these specific applications the military is already planning for HARP, but even perhaps the idea that the military might actually try to test these ideas, test these um, weapons capabilities within the HARP program. At this stage, I don't believe that many scientists on the front end, if, if any at the front end of the project, are aware of these particular applications. Somewhere within the Pentagon, somewhere within the military structure, these ideas are well known because the ideas are being expressed for the development of weapon programs across the country um, under, under the program guise of non-lethal weapons, things that don't kill you but just disable you. In terms of uh, where that goes and sort of how that lays out, Rapidly scanning radio frequency weapons were what was spoken about in low intensity conflict in modern technology. It's what's been spoken about in a number of um, exposés on weapon systems. When you look at a couple of other documents that we found in the course of our research, one particularly compelling document was from June of 1994, originating out of the International Red Cross in Geneva. This particular document lays out three levels of pulsed radio frequency energy um, activity. Um, it lays out the energy density and the frequencies of this energy. And what it suggests is that at a low level of energy, you could create biological effects, effects on human beings, such as those that we've discussed already and, and some others we'll discuss in a few moments. But it also lays out the whole idea of being able to create at a little higher energy level what's called bit errors in computers. This is where the information no longer flows smoothly through the computer circuitry. In fact, it causes computers to malfunction, and consequently, consequently the equipment, depending on those computers, malfunctions as well. At a little higher energy level, that same document describes the ability to burn or melt electronic circuits. Now, what's particularly interesting is this is the first time that we've seen actual frequency ranges and energy densities described in a particular government dealing, dealing with uh, non-lethal weapons. What everyone has seen in the, in the press has been discussions of non-lethal weapons in terms of sticky glues and nets and things that are pretty innocuous in terms of their effect on people. And at the end of each of those reports comes a small segment that deals with the idea of using radio frequency or pulsed radio frequency, and quickly they, they're quiet about it. Well, this technology has advanced significantly enough for the International Red Cross to start looking at the implications of that technology um, in international uh, um, affairs, and so that's why they put together their report on the technology. Now, we had a radio engineer review that particular application against the contract documents on HARP. And what we find is that within the capability of the HARP instrument are all of these applications, creating biological effects, bit errors in computers, as well as melting circuitry at certain energy levels when it's high enough. So at this stage of the game, although it's not a declared use by the military of this particular project, it's one that is certainly within its capability. Now the question becomes, would the military engage in a science that might be damaging to the American population. And let's talk about where that sits in terms of Alaska's history. In the early 1960s, Edward Teller, who was the father of the atom bomb, the hydrogen bomb, came to, the, came to uh, Alaska and he was promoting in the 60s the idea of um, detonating six thermonuclear devices at Point Hope, Alaska to excavate a bay. Now today we'd laugh about such a scheme because everybody knows a radioactive fallout would make the bay useless. Yet in the early 60s, Teller came to Alaska, proposed such a scheme under Project Chariot, which was um, an expose in a book called The Firecracker Boys. Now what happened there is they also lined up with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, the same people that are working on the HARP program. They sold that university on the wonderful applications of this technology, and they sold our state legislature and a number of community groups on the same thing, that the economic development aspects far outweighed any potential risks, and that, in fact, there were no risks. What happened then is three biological scientists associated with the University of Alaska stood in opposition to that project, along with native indigenous peoples of the North Slope, the Eskimos. And as a result, they stopped that project from moving forward. Yet, today, we look back on the record as they expose the science and it's clear the military knew the risks then. They were willing to engage in those risks in any event to further what they believed were 
um, important applications for national security, even though there might be what they call collateral damage in terms of Alaska and the people that live there. It's not an isolated incident. However. You look at mine control technologies, and you go back to the 70s. There was a report put together in 1970-75 by the United States Senate and the United States House of Representatives. A committee was configured shortly after the Watergate events to investigate abuses by the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, within the boundaries of the United States. In that investigation, a project was uncovered called MK Ultra, which was the use of mind control technologies by the CIA for domestic purposes. Now, what was disclosed in the Senate hearings, and one of those hearings occurred August 3, 1977, is clearly in the record, was that you could take... Um, a situation where the CIA supposedly doing work outside of the country, what they were doing within the country, among other things, were giving LSD to um, unconsenting people to, to look at the brain effects, uh, using hypnosis and a number of other psychological means for influencing behavior on American citizens without their consent. They were opening U.S. mail. They were infiltrating anti-war movement groups, all within the boundaries of the United States on American citizens. Going back to the atomic age, you can think back on the tests that were conducted in Nevada at a time when they wanted to see what the effects of radiation would be on servicemen exposed to high levels of radiation. The military knew what many of those effects would be, and they knew, in fact, that many of those effects would be bad. Yet they went forward um, sacrificing the few for what they believed was in the interest of the many, again, without consent. In Alaska, during the same period of time into the 50s, what was occurring there was the uh, injection of radioactive um, materials in Alaska Native populations. Now, this in the last few weeks has been, have been um, the subject of committee hearings in Washington, D.C., because the indigenous people of Alaska have launched a $400 million lawsuit against the federal government because, once again, they didn't ask for consent. They just went ahead and did it because they wanted to see how people living in northern regions would react to radioactive exposures. Now, these are just a few of the instances. Many other instances occur in our history where the question of the government's true intentions always need to be in the forefront of Americans. In terms of this particular technology as it applies to heart, would would the military engage in mind control technologies or behavioral change technologies on American populations? I think the answer to that is spoken best by Zbigniew Brzezinski because his belief was absolutely yes. The only way that this kind of technology wouldn't be used in that way is with sufficient outcry by populations within the United States. Now, I want to draw your attention to a more recent document, a document put together by the United States Army, by the Strategic Studies Institute of the United States Army, and it's called The Revolution in Military Affairs and Conflict Short of War. What this document shows and what it reveals is the idea that the technologies are advancing so rapidly in the military circles that it's, it's behind the value structure of Americans. In other words, it doesn't line up with what we believe is correct and right for our government to be engaged in. The examples they give are new weapon systems that are capable of dis disabling aircraft at a distance, such as HARP, where you can take down an aircraft with using radio frequencies and other radiations, microwave radiations, take out the avionics of an aircraft causing it to crash. And they suggest that this might be useful in fighting terrorists and drug trafficking in the United States. And while most of us would agree that, that these activities certainly run counter to the best interest of the American population, we, what we would not agree on is that the idea of convicting and executing people who are thought to be breaking the law um, is an appropriate approach. I mean, in our country, we believe in due process of law, where someone's accused of a crime, brought to trial, tried and convicted by a jury of their peers. What we don't support in this country is, is the execution of people without fair trial. Now, if we have this technology that can take aircraft out, we certainly have the technology to track them to when they land and properly um, bring those people to justice, if in fact they're criminals. What happens if the plane we interdict in that instance just carries a group of tourists and the government denies knocking it out? It's not the kind of technology we'd like to see. And those are examples that are given in the Revolution in Military Affairs Conflict Short of War, which is a relatively recent document. Going a little further on that same line, we can talk about the idea 
of this technology being applied for other purposes. Within that document, they talk about the technological advances being similar to the changes between the invention of gunpowder and where the modern age um, of weaponry began. But when you look back on, on some of the technological applications and advancements, one of the other areas that they just explore in that government document, that U.S. Army document, is the use of transponders, of implants under the skin of servicemen for the specific use of tracking them if they're captured in a combat situation. And well, for servicemen, that may be a very useful technology and one that they would like available to them, and certainly they should have the right to, to choose that. But they go a little further, and they talk about the use of that technology for the on, on business travelers traveling abroad, on the idea that once you cross over the boundaries of the United States, that maybe you'll get in a situation where you'll want to be extracted from a, um, a hostile environment with so many conflicts across the planet. Well, this may again be the case. Um, it's something that should be chosen individually because the ability to track people um, is, again, a violation of what we consider um, a right to privacy. But dropping back to mind control technologies for one moment, think about the idea of mind control technologies changing your behavior. Think about the First Amendment, the idea of freedom of speech, freedom of religion and freedom of the press all require first freedom of thought, freedom to feel what it is that you intend to feel and not something imposed on you from some external force out of your control. What bothers me most about the revolution in military affairs is that the United States Army in disclosing all of these technologies then lays out sort of a scenario for how to change American values to more closely correlate to the introduction of new weapons technologies. This is not the role of the United States Army or any other branch of government. Their role is to reflect American values, not to create them, to implement new technology advancements. The problem with this whole area, the HARP technology specifically, it's a very large delivery system. We've talked about numerous applications of that new weapon system. Some, all of us can agree, would be highly useful. Others much more sinister in the kinds of things that we really ought to question. The problem is it's not being adequately debated. The reason this video was made was to bring this issue to a lot more people so people could begin debating um, these very, very important issues. Some of the other things that we need to talk about in the course of this technology is some of the more positive applications. And if we talk about uh, some of those positive applications as we roll on, there's a couple of things that we've missed in disclosing um, some of the other things that can happen in terms of uh, this technology. When you think about the focusing capability which we've talked about and that amount of delivered energy reaching the ionosphere, and then you think about the amplification from the ionosphere from these nonlinear events which we've described, but then you think about it in one more sort of scenario. The magnetic lines of force around the planet follow very defined lines, and they come closest to the planet, closest to both the north and south poles. Interjecting energy into these naturally occurring lines may also create a nonlinear effect, a very large effect. It can be thought of as hitting the acupuncture points of the planet. Our concern is right now the planet's undergoing significant change, releases of energy that are being manifested in obscure, unusual weather patterns, by way of example. It's also being um, displayed when you think of energy releases from the planet in volcanic activity and earthquakes, which are increasing in the terms of earthquakes and frequency size, again demonstrating an energy release. Now what the HARP program planners will tell you is not to worry. What we're doing with HARP is a small amount of energy. But what we're suggesting is that small amount of energy, if it's resonated at just the right frequency, in just the right way, answering, entering into those critical acupuncture points of the planet, that you may be able to create a huge nonlinear effect. And the question becomes is, how close are we to the last straw on the camel's back of what our planet can handle in energy releases? Have we already passed that point and what we're seeing is just a continual release? And are we now going to inject even more power in the billions of watts range that's coherent, that's uniquely um, oriented to, to hit specific frequencies? Another particular point along this line is the Earth that was discovered resonates at 7.83 hertz or cycles per second. That's well within the range of the operating frequencies of harp. What happens if they strike that note or play that harp in just the right way as to resonate with that frequency? Would it cause the kinds of things that Nikola Tesla envisioned back in the early 1900s? 
what he envisioned were very destructive forces being released? Or would it, in the more modern times, more closely resemble the ideas of non-linear effects that J.F. Gordon MacDonald from UCLA envisioned, which was the input of a small amount of energy that could release enormous amounts of energy across the planet? These are questions that haven't been adequately asked, and we believe can't adequately be modeled by computer models or the kind of models that universities and military establishments would seek to utilize. The problem here is we're talking about a system that has the potential for damaging our ionosphere, which belongs to the planet. It's what keeps this life happening on this planet. It has the potential for creating huge physiological effects in populations as either a side effect or an intentional effect of a science. All of these things need to be explored. There are no biological scientists attached to the front end of this project, much different than the chariot project of the past where they wanted to detonate thermonuclear weapons. It was biologists that said, hey, wait, this is damaging. This is not a healthy thing. In terms of this technology, some of the other applications that Bernard Eastland spoke about might actually be quite useful. One of those applications were the idea of using a resonant frequency, a frequency that was tuned to the same frequency um, as, say, ozone in a way that would create more ozone in the ozone layer. Or in another instance, he believed that you could create um, nitrogen over areas that needed it for agriculture. Or in another instance, where you could destroy pollutants within the atmosphere using pulsed radio frequency, hitting those specific frequencies unique to those um, elements. Now, those are good applications and applications that we certainly ought to explore, but they ought to be explored within the context of a non-military science, a science that goes beyond the bounds of weapon systems. More than that, let's talk a little bit about some of the other physiological effects and what's been discovered about non-ionizing low levels of radiation and their effect on living organisms. In every living person, there's a number of elements that are in non-toxic levels, that if the levels were higher, they could create toxic effects. Iodine, for example. High levels of iodine will create a toxic effect. Low levels are unnoticeable. They won't create any problems whatsoever. But if you send in a pulsed radio frequency that resonates, resonates with or vibrates with that, that element, that, uh, that chemical, what it creates is the effect of having ingested a large amount, in other words, a toxic effect, and yet it's a small amount. So when they do the blood work on you, they say, oh, there's no problem here. We can't understand why you're manifesting this illness. And yet within your system is enough iodine to create the effect. The effect of that is you're ill. You have all the symptoms of iodine poisoning without any chemicals showing up in your body. As a weapons effect, that's interesting. But as, a, as an effect for um, a side effect, it certainly um, could be quite damaging. As a physiological effect, one of the things to consider is that this same science, this idea of resonating specific frequencies for creating the same reaction to certain chemicals in your body, this is being utilized in Europe for healing purposes. So in Europe, where they're using the same basic foundational science for healing, in our country, in the United States, we're using this technology for killing. Uh, specifically, a gentleman, Dr. Reho Michaela in Finland, is using a system of laser electroacupuncture for the purpose of stimulating energy flow through the body. It's based on non-ionizing radiations, low levels of radiation. The laser, you, when you feel it on your skin, feels no more than a feather tapping your skin in terms of the electrical and uh, energy coming off of um, the field that surrounds the laser light itself. It's a combination of electricity and laser light, but at a low, low level. Enough to break skin resistance, enough to enter your body, enough to cause chemical changes that then create a change in, in the general state of health. The same technology, the same foundational science is applied by the military in these kinds of weapon systems in what are called non-lethal weapon systems. But non-lethal weapons are not lost on just uh, as, as systems for just the military. Our Justice Department has spent a number of uh, conferences developing this technology as well. And this is sort of the other half of the HARP story in the sense of things we ought to be concerned about uh, as, as Americans and citizens of the world, actually. The non-lethal weapons, most recently, 60 Minutes, just a few weeks ago, showed a radio frequency weapon system used to make people have symptoms of uh, flu-like symptoms or seasick symptoms where you're totally disoriented. This is an important um, an, an important issue because these kinds of weapons, as they're applied 
to physiology need to be explored again from a healing perspective. Electromedicine is the medicine of the future. It is what's coming. It's here in many parts of the world. In the next 10 years, we'll see more developments in this area. It's time to take that base science that the military has developed and transfer it to civilian hands. But the way they're transferring it right now, injustice. In 1985, there was a conference um, a conference held by the Justice Department to explore sort of new non-lethal weapon systems, weapons that could be used for riot control purposes and other purposes by justice. What they said at that time was, you know, the, really the place to go for this for this knowledge is to the military because they they have it all, but it's classified. In 1987, there was a follow-up conference. In that conference, they again discussed the idea that the military holds the technology, but they said, you know, we're at a point where maybe we can bridge some dialogue. And in that bridging of dialogue, what they said is, but if we do this, if we're going to bring this technology over from defense for defense purposes to domestic use, we really need to do it through an open process, a process that everyone can participate in and see so that it doesn't result in some kind of leak of information that might cause um, problems for the introduction of the technology. The next conference, 1993, was held, held and sponsored by Los Alamos Laboratories. The entire conference was classified, except for one small segment of it, which was the agenda. And within that agenda, the very leak they were looking for not happening has happened, because what they were talking about was radio frequency weapon systems for the use of manipulating uh, human behavior. In terms of what does that mean to us? It means that Department of Defense technologies have now been transferred to Department of Justice for use within the boundary of the United States. Why is this important? When you think about the other areas of non-lethal technology, which do include, in some cases, chemicals and chemical weapons, weapons that are forbidden under international agreement from being used in a war conflict situation with a declared enemy of the United States. But within the context of those chemical weapons treaties, there's an exemption. And the exemption is you can use them for domestic use. Moreover, you can continue to develop them for domestic use. We cite the chapter and section of that chemical weapons treaty specifically within our book because it is important. The United States signed off an agreement that says what we cannot use against a declared enemy, we can use as a country against our own citizens. Fundamentally, that's wrong. In terms of where does it go from here, we have now this huge transfer of technology, not just in chemical weapons, but in non-lethal weapons occurring from Department of Ten Defense to Department of Justice, which allows the government to continue to develop these weapons technologies outside of Department of Defense, but in a way where they can be used against citizens for either riot control or crowd control, or who knows? Because the thing about radio frequency weapons that's unique, you can't see it coming. It's not like a bullet. It's not like a club. It's something you can't even see coming at you. Without the right equipment to detect, you don't even know you're being affected, except you're disoriented or, you're, or you've lost bladder control, which is one of the other things that can do. At some energy levels, according to Captain Tyler, you can even induce heart attack. So we're talking about technologies that are here now, that are being developed now, and that are now being transferred for domestic purposes. One of the other side effects uh, and one of the other potential effects of this system, of this HARP system, is the idea that it may interfere with migration patterns of certain animals. In Alaska, this is critically important because many of our people there rely on the migration patterns of animals for their sustenance. What we're talking about is a big departure from, from the traditional theory about how migration patterns and how animals orient when they migrate. Um, the traditional scientists will say they orient by um, land formations, light, gravity, etc. Basically things that are in the touch-feel area. Others are saying and suggesting now because of some recent discoveries that perhaps the orientation is along magnetic lines of force. And that within the brains of number of, of species of animals they found a mineral called magnetite, which is electromagnetically active. And they believe that this may be the switch that causes animals to migrate from one location to another. In fact, it might go far when you think about geophysical um, disturbances manifesting also in changes in magnetic lines of force. Maybe that goes a long way to describing why whales and dolphins are beaching themselves. Perhaps they're just disoriented. 
when you think about it in, in terms of migration patterns, we are going to inject energy into the magnetic lines of force. It's going to alter their character. If it alters it substantially, these migration patterns of caribou, salmon, and other animals may be greatly, greatly impacted. So we're concerned about that as well. Overall, we talked in this presentation about a number of potential applications for this technology, a number of ways it can be used both beneficially and negatively. What we're asking for now is a moratorium on the science until it can be more broadly reviewed by a contingent of scientists that don't work for the military, that don't necessarily work for academic institutions who draw most of their money from military establishment, but are truly independent and are leaders in their field. So the legislative bodies can begin to review this technology and its proper use and determine whether or not it needs to be set aside like nuclear energy or whether it needs to be advanced in a proper uh, form for the benefit of human beings. It's not a simple issue. We've done a lot of research in compiling our data. It's not our words, it's their words. The only thing we've done is put it in form where it's easily understood. Welcome to a presentation on Angels Don't Play This Harp, based on the book by the same name, published by Earth Pulse Press. What we're here to talk about is a ground-based Star Wars weapon system that's being operated in the state of Alaska in a remote location uh, called Gakona. The project um, is an interesting project. We'll cover the various aspects that the military has disclosed, the University of Alaska has disclosed, and we'll also talk about a number of the applications that they've kept hidden from the public view. But first, a little bit of background on me. My name is uh, Nick Begich. I have a doctorate in complementary medicines from the Open International University for Complementary Medicines in Sri Lanka. And I also have a political background, having been involved in the Alaska Federation of Teachers in Alaska, serving as president for two terms, and the Anchorage Council of Education, also serving as president for two terms. My family has been politically involved in the state for a couple of generations. My father served in the state senate he also served the United States Congress and the 92nd Congress in the early 70s. The project itself was an interesting one and one that we really weren't looking for. I think the project was more or less looking for us. Um, the project is a jointly managed project by the Air Force and Navy being worked in conjunction with the Geophysical Institute, which is part of the University of Alaska system. This project um, was initially started um, actually the, the the work leading up to it in the middle 80s and eventually in the early 90s the project was kicked off with an initial funding level um, by the federal government of approximately 30 million dollars. The project covers a number of military applications um, that's being characterized by the military however it's strictly a research project. 
which is interesting in and of itself. The way they characterize the project as a research project, HARP, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project, they've, they've made um, indication that what we're really talking about is a project to study the aurora. But the project goes far beyond um, study of the aurora in terms of, of its applications. In fact, it's more or less a misnomer to suggest that this is strictly about auroral research. It could be um, like characterizing, uh, in, in many respects, the um, Manhattan Project, which brought us the atom bomb, as being strictly a research project, not ever leading, of course, to a weapon system, which we all know is not the case at all. What HARP is, is a very large transmitting system. It's a system designed um, to generate or something we might be able to do. And the, the, the conclusions for Bernard were, Really, there might be. There was um, a vision in his mind of a weapon system that might be um, applied to this particular um, use, and, and it required a large amount of energy. But not only did it require a large amount of energy, it also required a very specific location, and that location is the closest um, that they could get where large supplies of natural gas would be available to the um, place where magnetic lines of force intersect the Earth, which just so happens uh, to fit the bill for the North Slope of Alaska. So Bernard began working on a series of patents. And the first um, patent dealt with the idea of focusing energy in a very unique way, different from any other radio frequency uh, transmitter previously designed. And when, you, when we look at what, what he envisioned, when you think about radio frequency energy um, coming off of an antenna, normally what you can visualize can be shown as energy going up and the energy getting less and less dense as it, as it moves higher and higher in elevation. And this depicts more or less the way traditional radio frequency transmitters work. The area they're trying to affect is the ionosphere, which is located approximately uh, 32 to 620 miles above the Earth. So it's a high area, it's a high level. Um, what Bernard did is develop an antenna field concept, which used instead of one antenna, it used an array, which is what we have at HARP. And by firing that array in a unique way, um, by sequencing the firing, they're able to focus the energy to a very narrow point in the ionosphere. What's important here is when you talk about radio frequency energy and when you talk about the way energy is focused, the old technologies, the technologies that the military often references when talking about ionospheric heaters, which is what they, they term these huge transmitters, they talk about the energy um, in some instances, the energy going into the antenna array, which is interesting. They also sometimes talk about the energy coming off of the antenna array at the ground. But never do they really talk about the amount of energy concentrated or focused in the ionosphere. Now, the ionosphere itself is an area um, situated very, very high um, above the Earth, as, as I've said. But it's also a very important area for our immediate um, environment. This particular layer can be visualized as a bubble surrounding the planet. Um, this bubble of, of energized particles keep um, uh, particle streams that would be dangerous to uh, human health from entering our immediate environment, such as x-rays, cosmic rays, and uh, various uh, radiations coming from the sun. So it acts as more or less a shield, a natural shield, to protect the planet. Without it, life would be impossible here. And this is the area that the military intends to as they say, perturb, as we say, disturb, um, deliberately for weapons effects. Now, what's important and what's very different about this technology is the military will cite um, the idea that these ionosphere heaters are located in many, many places around the planet. However, what's, what is located around the planet do not have the power levels um, that this particular transmitter um, has. What happens in, in the energy tr transfer, starting with the um, uh, ideal, ideally it would be natural gas, currently it's um, diesel power generators on site, generate electricity. That electricity then runs through the apparatus on the ground, the ionospheric heater, and through a principle called antenna gain, you get an effective radiated power in the upward uh, level with this system of one billion watts of effective radiated power. Now that's the power coming off the ground. If we go back to this image of focusing energy again for just one moment. So what we're talking about in terms of energy, it's not the energy going into the systems or into the antenna arrays. And it's not the energy coming directly off the antenna arrays at, at the ground level. What we're concerned about is the amount of energy 
at the point in which we're trying to create effects, which is the ionosphere. And as you can see from this um, characterization, the old technology spread that energy out. It was very, very um, low-density energy, whereas the new technology, the technologies developed by Bernard Eason, focus that energy into a very narrow beam. This is, this is the rating that is most appropriate, most important in describing this particular technology. In terms of talking about um, where this energy goes, what happens with this um, energy in terms of the, the overall project. When, when the military first unveiled this project back in uh, 9091, what they were talking about was the fact that, hey, this was unique because we had this unique focusing and steering capability different from any ionospheric heater in the world that would give us incredibly greater power potentials. More than that, they also compared to other systems operating around the world. There are five of these um, transmitters in the former Soviet Union. There's also uh, a system called Izikat in the uh, in Europe, and there's a very large transmitter um, in North Norway. The transmitter in Norway has a billion watts of effective radiated power up the ground, but using the old configuration, spreading energy out. The new technology is again the very big breakthrough for Bernard Eastland, uh, and also for Arco Power Technologies. Now, what's also unique when you think about energy being transferred to the ionosphere to create the varying effects. If, if we look at that image and we, and we talk again about the uh, idea of a, a bubble around the planet, this is another image of Bernardi's and it's showing uh, very clearly um, what can happen if you can energize this area. What he shows in, in energizing this is, is this uh, cyclotron resonance effect that creates this bubble. The amount of energy required to create a global effect is quite large. In fact, when Bernard Eason first envisioned this system, the amount of energy um, that he, he visualized coming off of an antenna field was somewhere on the order of 100 million watts. And we're going to come back to that number as we go through the presentation today because a very important um, issue in terms of what um, this project um, could entail. One of the things that um, when we go through the discussion of the applications of the technology, we'll, we'll talk a little bit, too, about the power levels necessary to create these varying effects. In terms of the overall um, program itself by the military, the military has maintained throughout this project that it has nothing to do with Bernard Eastland, which is, is in and of itself um, probably the uh, biggest departure from the truth. When you look at the fact pattern, the paper trail on the project, which we're going to present in a few moments, you'll see how Bernard Eastland's work really does come into play on this project. What Bernard envisioned um, was a single antenna field of very large size. In fact, the, the um, size that he envisioned initially ran 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers square, huge by anyone's standards. HARP is, of course, much, much smaller than that at this stage of its element. But as we go into the next slide to look at the overall effects, a couple things that we can first take a quick look at. And if you look at the owner of this um, patent, um, this is APTI Incorporated, which is Arco Power Technologies, Inc., which is the subsidiary of Arco Atlantic Richfield. In this particular patent, not by Bernard, but one built upon Bernard Eason's ideas at the lower portion of the screen, in this section under U.S. Patents References Cited, this is where, um, where you're required to show um, the information as to where it came from or what built your idea. And when you look at the other portion of the screen, you know, what was this particular idea um, building? Well, it was a particle, it was based in part on a particle beam weapon system, on backscattering technologies, which is radar technology we'll talk about shortly, and also space-based ballistic missile defense systems or Star Wars systems. When you look at the uh, next slide, which shows sort of the application of what this specific um, specific weapon um, application is, I think we can see uh, quite clearly what we're talking about. In this case, we have graphically depicted at the bottom of the screen an antenna. Um, an antenna. In this case, it's a single antenna, but um, it's strictly for graphic purposes. What it does is it sends energy up, creates an energy field around um, these objects in space, and then using a gamma ray detector which is actually um, one, of the, one of the inventions that are held by APTI in a packet of inventions, can determine which of those um, objects are actually carrying um, nuclear payloads and which are not. Now, why is that important? When you think about 
um, attack, which the military didn't envision for a couple of decades. What they envision happening is 100,000 incoming objects. And of those 100,000 incoming objects, perhaps 100, maybe 200, maybe as many as 1,000 would actually carry nuclear payloads. In order to isolate the target, you have to be able to discriminate which are decoys and which actually are genuine threats because there's no way that we have the capability of, with certainty, taking out all of those um, targets. So the situation is in terms of the military has been, how do you distinguish? What can we do? In this particular uh, technological application, what you have is a system that can discriminate. In other words, reducing the targets to those that are really um, targets of interest. And this is done with um, a transmitter such as HARP being able to generate power levels of sufficient quantity and size. Now, it's not the only patent. As I said, there are 12 patents associated with this project. Three were Bernard Eastland's. The others were based in large part on, on his work. But all of those other patents that were based on his work required one unique feature. They required a focusing capability. This was the key element in Bernard's work. In fact, the key element leading to his patent. The slide that we had showed earlier showing that um, showing that energy focus is, is really important in terms of um, application. And looking at this next um, slide, what we also see here is the idea of creation, creating um, an ionized um, uh, clouds above the Earth. Now, what this is used for is reflecting um, radio frequency energy for over-the-horizon radar applications. And you can see here also it is an APTI, Arco Power Technologies Patents, and you can see the references cited again. This work is based in part on Bernard Eason's um, previous patents, again showing a connection and a trail. In terms of the next slide, it shows sort of the application of this and what it looks like graphically. And this is important in terms of describing the technology. When you look at this particular aspect of the project and what it does, in this, in this view, you can see what they're using here again graphically is they're creating a, a, a plasma layer in the ionosphere. And this can be um, visualized as a layer of energy. energy. Um, and what it is used for is reflecting energy from another transmitter over the horizon. And you can see the horizon of the Earth, a great deal of radio frequency energy. The way that energy um, is, is, is created, first of all, is by uh, electrical energy going into um, an apparatus that's been designed uh, by the military. that goes into an antenna array. And we can look at a few slides of that array just to give a general idea of what um, specifically we're talking about. The array itself is, is an antenna field, which is a large um, configuration. It's not just a simple radio transmitter as such. It's more than that. It's a field of antennas that work in, in conjunction with one another. Um, and just to kind of flip through the slides just a bit so you get an idea of, of what these look like. The array itself is pretty large. It covers, um, at this point, um, a number of acres. And as it expands, as the site expands, it'll expand to um, covering many, many, many times um, more acres in, ter in, in terms of this field. The antennas themselves are fired sequentially in, um, in order to get a focusing capacity, which we'll discuss as we go, go on with the presentation today. But basically what we're talking about is something much different than just a standard radio transmitter. In fact, um, many aspects of the project, uh, the project itself has been characterized as an open science project. And yet, when you look at uh, some of the um, early early stages of the project, you see some things that sort of don't run um, uh, consistent with that particular thought. When you look back at the original postings on the property itself that the military posted, and the prime spokesman for the project being uh, John Hecksher, he lays out um, a large... Uh, amount of the information in a way that that people can understand, but at the same time in a, in a complex way in which uh, many many word games are played. When we first launched the book itself and started talking about the project openly, the first thing that happened was the signs came down. These are the standard signage that's up on military installations, um, warning people that if in fact that you violate the perimeters that you're in violation of the National Security Act. 
uh, being an open project as militaries characterized it, and when we started challenging that characterization, um, they quickly removed these signs. They then uh, initiated an open house, invited everyone in uh, to look at the project to see that there was nothing so sinister there. But it's kind of interesting. It would be like um, the average person looking at a uh, intercontinental ballistic missile carrying a nuclear warhead. What are you going to see from the outside shell? So they basically took the shell down, took the uh, perimeter signs down, and, and gave a little higher visibility uh, to the project in terms of the public. This project was interesting in the way it began. It began with um, the ideas of a particular inventor, Bernard Eastland. And Bernard was um, uh, hired by Arco Power Technologies. Actually, the company that hired him originally was Atlantic Ridgefield, which is the parent of Arco Power Technologies. And around his ideas, they built the subsidiary. And the subsidiary's role was to find a place, a way, to burn uh, natural gas on the north slope of Alaska, um, and bring that gas into a marketable form. Currently, Alaska produces approximately a million and a half barrels of oil a day from the north slope of Alaska. We do not have a gas line constructed yet, and the primary owners of the gas that's on the slope, which involve trillions of cubic feet of natural gas, um, is Arco, Atlantic Richfield, and another company, British Petroleum. So. Arco was looking for this way, some way to consume this power, and they hired Bernard, and they said, Bernard, we want a way to develop a market for this uh, gas, even without a pipeline. 